to other repertoires in the creation of even larger circles or roofs under which everything can fit. Much of my work these days focuses on settler colonial theory and indigenous experimentalisms, and I worry about the idea of a heading that can fit all things, or the expansionist project that, projects that view themselves as benevolent. But in that sense, music has become as much of a danger to me as inclusive heading, as minimalism is or could be or might be. So I think often as a result, a lot of my books peer review comments, which I think probably came from someone who's up here right now, um, <laughs> that my way of approaching questions of inclusion um, versus a kind, kind of the kind of inclusion of in, on minimalism, Will and Carey's book, versus a kind of imminent dwelling and critique of what already is present in repertoire, as in my book, sets up an unnecessary binary. We can be we can both include in repertoire and criticize the terms of their initial exclusion which is of course obvious when you say it out loud in a room full of music scholars, but it was tricky for me when I was spiraling and buzzing and whirring in on the more conceptual and philosophical orientations that I thought were the primary aspect of my book. And in the end, that is its broader point. I think more than being about minimalism in particular, the names of minimalism is more of a historiography and authorship, and indeed how these two criteria overlap in the musicological relationship to names and naming. I worry at times that there isn't much that a scholar deeply devoted to minimalism will learn about that repertoire in my book. Rather, the focus is on burrowing deep into what I often call resonant adjacencies and listening to the pulsing, throbbing, worrying difference tones that result from that kind of embedded listening positionality. What minimalism achieved, for me, is a kind of imminent performance of the impossibility of conventional compositional authorship after the late 1960s. I think I still hold to that being true. We we're all quite cynical about such death of the author arguments, but I find myself drawn always to a mode of listening, writing, and thinking that might take seriously the ethical obligations proposed in that moment. The broadest point being that we're all very good at taking apart utopian, optimistic, and radical lines of thinking, um, and that to disseminate the underlying inequalities, oh, sorry, to dissimulate, and to dissimulate the underlying inequalities or capitalist logics that remain at play has become pretty straightforward for most of us. But what my book asks most broadly, it returns past historical examples and attempts to reconstruct methods, models for egalitarian and ethical practices. So that's all I have to say for now. We'll all say lots more as we move through the panel. Um, but I think, who's next? Simon, I'll talk next. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, I'm Sumant Gopanath. I teach at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and uh, am the co-editor of Rethinking Reich, which is another of our collection of minimalism books up there. I'm currently working on a book project on musical minimalism. Uh, it's provisionally titled Questions for Minimalism. So this is sort of related to that. Two quotes have been on my mind lately. The first. Um, is well known to scholars of musical minimalism from an interview with Steve Reich in the mid-1980s. Quote, Schoenberg gives a very honest musical portrayal of his times. I salute him. But I don't want to write like him. Stockhausen, Berio, and Boulez were portraying in very honest terms what it was like to pick up the pieces of a bombed out continent after World War II. But for some American in 1948 or 1958 or 1968, in the real context of tail fins, Chuck Berry, and millions of burgers sold, to pretend that instead we're really going to have the dark brown angst of Vienna is a lie, a musical lie. And I think these people are musical liars and their work isn't worth that." End quote. Reich's explicit target here is the largely white American 12-tone tradition, Milton Babbitt, Elliot Carter, Charles Warren, who later became his friend, and numerous others. But to anyone thinking critically about race in the US, as most of us in music studies these days are now, the quote presents a quandary. The mid-century US American consumer utopia described by Reich, fueled in no small measure by black vernacular musics, as the Chuck Berry mentioned, uh, is an interesting one in relation to that, was much less available to African Americans, especially the black working class experiencing US apartheid in the Jim Crow South, or its de facto equivalents in northern cities. What might that mean for experimentally minded black musicians? 
In the interview, Reich goes on to name the sources of minimalism as he saw it, including the undercurrent, in his word, in jazz, quote, particularly to John Coltrane and maybe Eric Dolphy, quote. Reich's colorist phrase, dark brown angst, resonates differently when thinking about the social structures of racism that appear to have led numerous black creators, from black composers in the concert lineage to composer performers in the jazz and free jazz lineages, including Coltrane and especially Dolphy, to explore dissonant modernist musical languages that, one could argue, powerfully portrayed aspects of black subjective experience, especially alienation and pessimism in the face of white supremacy, a logic captured well by Fumi Okiji's jazz as critique from 2018. The second quote come, stems from a discussion of the composed, black composer Julia Perry, 1924 to 1979, whose remarkable music has received renewed attention in the last couple of years. Much credit goes to Kendra Preston Leonard, who has been collecting and sharing PDFs of manuscripts, biographical texts, and other materials by the Julia Perry Working Group, which she founded all in the service of advocating for a hitherto woefully neglected composer. And this is despite the earlier efforts of scholars like Helen Walker Hill, James Shaw Edwards, and others. In a chapter of the 2023 volume, Expanding the Canon, edited by Melissa Hogue, Preston Leonard describes one of Perry's pieces, uh, a harp and percussion work titled Homunculus CF from 1960, as serial minimalism, partly in reference to Jeremy Grimshaw's work on Lamont Young's Trio for Strings from 1958 and states, and the quote here says, while we often associate minimalism with white male composers, it is worth noting that Perry was 10 years older then and composing in a minimalist style well before uh, composers usually associated with the origins of minimalism, end quote. Preston Leonard's analytical observations on the piece are immensely helpful. And having been teaching Perry's Stabat Mater, probably her most famous piece, in my post tonal theory class this semester, I plan to use and credit her essay on homunculus CF in a future lecture. But her attribution of minimalism to Perry's work gives me pause for two reasons. The first reason is that, to my ears, the piece is certainly remarkable and innovative, but also very much in the lineage of US, experimental, US experimentalist percussion works, including those by Morez, Cowell, Parch, Harrison, and Cage, among numerous others. While there are definitely minimalistic qualities to Perry's composition, um, some striking ones in particular, um, it and other exemplars of this tradition are generally too complex and too internally heterogeneous to be minimalist, at least for me. Um, perhaps they're best described as proto-minimalist. Um, and then here are the two examples. short like a tool through this piece. It's not
So the second reason for my the Gibson cause is because of the first reason. Why do I care about this term and its flexible use in this way? The answer has in part to do with path dependency. With years of having built a career around something that I have long felt dubious about, writing about and publishing on Steve Reich, which is justified in my mind uh, because of my critical vantage point. Um, Patrick just talked about this question. Teaching a course for many years on musical minimalism and being part of a society dedicated to it, Society for Minimalist Music, and even cashing in modestly on an extensive, largely white fan culture built around it. And that's sort of related to the minimalism music industry that we're all kind of a part of in some way. I care because I think I know what it is, but it seems churlish and nearly pointless to police the use of the term. Still, I can't help but feel that at some level we have failed. By we, I mean the music scholarly community, including myself, that reified a journalistic conceit motivated first by curiosity about a small, overwhelmingly white music scene, and largely in New York, that eventually morphed into an aesthetic category indelibly marked by US nationalism, backed by Anglophone enthusiasts, largely celebrating a cohort of straight white men, albeit of various black, of varied class backgrounds, and built on a foundation of cultural appropriation of non-Western and Western vernacular musics that was once viewed as inclusive and humble, and now in many ways looks like the height of arrogant unaccountability. As a professional music theorist, in most contexts, I am liberated from the burden of presenting a coherent historical narrative to students, and in seeing my historian colleagues struggle with these questions, I've come to wonder about the so-called century of isms and the interrelations between modernist and postmodernist movements, implicit claims about technical and aesthetic progress, minimalism being one of the last defined movements of Western concert music, and the widespread efforts to rethink representation in concert programming and music pedagogy. If innovation, rather than other metrics of quality, continues to predominate pedagogical priorities, it may occlude other ways of telling history, such as the centering of the critical impulse of many black creators, including Perry and Julius Eastman, and its profound difference from the goals of their white contemporaries. Hello everyone, I'm Victor Zabo, author of Turn On, Tune In, Drift Off, Ambient Music's Psychedelic Past. And given my expertise on popular and electronic music, uh, I'd like to think about minimalism from this angle, starting with an anecdotal example. So here's a flyer for a behavior party that uh, took place on February 24th, 2024, in Richmond, Virginia, at an undisclosed location called the Warehouse. Uh, it started at 10.30 p.m., and I arrived at 11.30 p.m. to find around 70 attendees, uh, which then grew to around 100 present at peak activity around 12.31, something like that. Uh, the crowd thinned out following the headliner Clouds, who finished DJing at 2 a.m., at which point local DJ Saika started spinning techno to a fluctuating crowd of around 20 to 40 people for the next couple of hours. Uh, Here's what that party looked like, um, according to my phone. And uh, I want to go ahead and play you just a bit of DJ Saika's set. Um, I apologize for the low quality audio uh, pocket phone. <laughs> Pick up on a bit of uh, profanity in a moment, just bear warning.
asking if that's Sam Bullinger. Um, <laughs> so, uh, of course, you can hear a fair bit of chatter going on here, and um, some audience members indeed did not shut the F up. They, considered, uh, they continued talking. Um, others danced. Let me see if we got, yeah, so you can see some folks dancing, particularly in the front. Um, and, you know, this had me wondering during the party, is really the only difference between concert minimalism and techno DJing the behavior of the listeners? Um, and where concert goers, you know, seem to listen quietly while ravers talk and move and don't shut the F up. Um, and yet, others at the party who uh, I like to call... <laughs> I like to call these the rave dads. Uh, they stand in the back and listen attentively. So maybe not. Uh, nevertheless, I thought it would be appropriate to bring up techno here in Techno City, uh, Detroit, the birthplace of techno. Um, although the style of techno that Psycho was spinning arguably takes stronger influence from Berlin um, than Detroit. But whatever the case, I think it might be productive to wonder out loud, is techno minimalism? Uh, of course, I think the answer depends on how one defines minimalism, and I think all sorts of definitions, technical, institutional, historical, network-based, style-based, are potentially valid given the context of the question. Um, in my own scholarship, I don't get too hung up on whether techno or any other popular style counts as minimalism, as though counting as minimalism would make it any more worthy of consideration or any more valuable as art. Uh, I treat minimalism in my own work as one of various terms yoking together music comprised largely of drones and loops, technically rooted in electronics and automated systems, culturally rooted in psychedelic countercultures and experimental avant-garde, spatialized through amplification, developed through gradual and continuous processes, creating states of boredom, disorientation, meditation, hypnosis, ecstasy, transcendence. Techno is another such term, as is ambient. And all of these styles are relevant to my newest research project on the aesthetics of the DJ set in underground electronic music cultures. As I see it, techno is plainly and obviously directly related to the concert music that scholars commonly regard as minimalist, if not of a piece with it. Uh, and yet there are significant differences as well, both stylistically and culturally, which is probably why if I asked anyone at the party what kind of music was playing, they would say techno, not minimalism. Uh, <laughs> so perhaps it makes sense to understand techno, like uh, Robert Fink has suggested, as one of many post-minimalisms, and I have to credit him with implanting this now obvious seeming connection in my mind in the first place. Uh, or maybe it also makes sense to think of techno after David Toop as a black minimalism, given its original stylistic development among black teenagers in Detroit. Uh, but also maybe not. Uh, authors Matthew Collin, DeForest Brown Jr., and Joan Malloy do not once mention minimalism in their lovingly researched books on techno. And minimalism only comes up once in Dan Sicko's Techno Rebels, in which producer Daniel Bell dismisses minimalism as a superficial way to brand techno as arty. Musicologist Lloyd Weitzel trenchantly argued in his article, White Noise, that minimalism as a style might even be understood in terms of white racial self-representation, and so it could seem uh, arguably inappropriate to label techno-minimalists given this understanding. But uh, this is just meant to, again, produce some discussion as we move forward through this panel. I think we can um, think about what is gained by drawing these connections, uh, I think potentially a lot, and what is lost as well. Thank you. Hello, I am Carrie O'Brien, and I'm co-editor of On Minimalism, along with Will Robin. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about the historiographical and methodological aims of our project. So our book begins from the premise that minimalism has become too small, too narrow, too male and too white, revolving around just four people, four men, sometimes called the big four, Lamont Young, Steve Reich, Philip Glass, and Terry Riley. And we're not the first to note this narrow focus, and many scholars have worked to remedy it, either purposely or inadvertently, whether writing a minor history of Tony Conrad, as Brandon Joseph has done, or writing about figures like Julius Eastman, as Sumant has done. 
Other scholars have looked beyond the classical notated canon towards popular genres, like Vic does in his book on ambient music, or as Patrick does in his on No Wave and Punk. To some extent, our book does these things too. We expand genre categories too, we go way beyond the big four, and we question how we got down to this really winnowed history in the first place. But what's unique about our approach is that we focus on sources. Our book is a primary source reader a collection of over 100 historical texts. And while conversations of minimalism often revolve around names, either these big four names or in expanded versions, names like, say, Julius Eastman, we wanted to look behind the names to look at the primary sources. And as it turned out, the sources could be just as limited as these names. One could go so far as to say that minimalism scholarship has a big four of primary sources. <laughs> If you look at the major monographs on minimalism, the majority of the primary sources fall into four main categories, and these have overlap between them. And it's not completely unique to minimalist music. Anyone doing 20th, 21st century uh, research, there'll be some similarity here. The first would be composer interviews or composer statements. Keith Potter's foundational book is dominated by uh, lengthy composer interviews he did. The second is composer archives, whether they're personal or held by foundations. Jeremy Grimshaw's book on Lamont Young is a great example of this. The third is newspaper concert reviews. Um, for minimalism, the New York Times and the Village Voice dominate. And uh, Edward Strickland's book is a great example of this. And the fourth is profiles, whether in newspapers or magazines, popular press. But the thing about each of these types of sources is that they each have inherent biases. First of all, all four types prioritize the composer, either the composer's voice, or the composer's music, or the composer's archive, and what they've chosen to save. Newspaper reviews often prioritize live events at major venues. Composer archives bias composers who either have the time, space, and money to have their materials stored in temperature-controlled spaces, or are famous enough for a foundation to pay for that kind of space and access, which is the case for a composer like Steve Reich. Further, each of these types of sources have biases in terms of access. Newspapers like the New York Times and the Village Voice are cited constantly in minimalism scholarship, in part because they are so easy to access. Both are quickly available through online databases and online reprints. There are other excellent newspapers on minimalism from the 1970s, like Soho News or Ear Magazine, but they're rarely cited because they're nowhere online. This is changing slowly for Ear Magazine. For these reasons, for these reasons, our book features a number of these hard-to-access out-of-print sources, in part to counteract some of this. But we admit, of course, that our book isn't immune to these biases. We publish Village Voice reviews and composer statements, like this one, by Steve Reich, uh, which printed in the New York Times, 1973. And Sumat has written ex uh, extensively about this. Uh, we, we realize that it's no mistake, though, that re reviews and profiles of Reich and Glass show up in the New York Times and not, say, profiles or composer statements by Catherine Christer Hennix or Julius Eastman. The New York Times, like every major media outlet during minimalism's heyday, skewed white and straight and male, and not just the subjects of their articles, but the authors, the editors, the publishers. And for this reason, we actively sought out sources in our book that celebrate other voices. We print a profile of Alice Coltrane from Essence magazine, the Black Women's magazine, or a feature on Meredith Monk from the feminist magazine Miss, and a piece on the ambient musician Laraji from the journal Black American. But still, consulting a source like Essence doesn't solve the issue that primary sources on minimalism also overwhelmingly prioritize newspapers and magazines, which further prioritize major composers, their works, their concerts, and events. But the history of minimalism didn't always occur on stage. One of my favorite items that we print is an excerpt from an interview with Anaya Lockwood, where she describes an all-women's droning group that she participated in in the mid-1970s. And this is a horribly blurry photo that Will just found a few weeks ago in Ear Magazine. Oh, oh that was in the high <laughs> <laughs> um, That is the only photo that it exists of it. It's one of the only like documents that exists of it. But she describes in this interview an all-women's droning group. Now, this interview is an improbable item to include in our history of minimalism. Anaya Lockwood is no card-carrying minimalist. She has no public archive. There were no concert reviews, because it wasn't exactly a concert. There weren't any composition titles, so it doesn't show up on her works list. 
The source does still come from a composer interview, but we've managed to fight the biases of that type of source multiple ways by interviewing multiple members of the group and telling a collective story of four women who experimented with drones together for years. In order for Anaya Lockwood to figure into the history of minimalism, one needs to look elsewhere to other kinds of sources. To conclude, I'll just put up this image of absolutely my favorite book, uh, favorite source for my book, the WKCR radio playlist from a two-day minimalism festival in the summer of 1980. And I'll let you look at it for just a moment. It, it'll zoom in, in in a moment as I play one of the tracks from the festival, Laura Spiegel's Expanding Universe a composer and a work rarely considered in histories of minimalist music. And this festival playlist, in which the big four still clearly dominate, shows how big and wide minimalism once was. It's circa 1980, yeah. I'll do it. The festival playlist, in which the big four still clearly dominate, shows how big and wide minimalism once was ranging from the music of Don Cherry to Laurie Anderson to the Velvet Underground. And its scratch marks and pencil markings show how provisional minimalism once was and suggests that perhaps it maybe still could be. Um, you've heard Carrie speak a bit about some of the substantive historiographical elements of the project, and I'd like to talk about another key goal for our book, one that was particularly important to me, its function as public scholarship. A question that we're going to likely tackle among the panelists today, after I do this talk, is why we should continue to talk about quote-unquote minimalism at all, or at least perpetuate its usage in our work. It is, after all, a problematic, dated product of white supremacist, colonialist, patriarchal thinking, and also, importantly, a label that pretty much all of the music's notable practitioners have actually disavowed. I think there are very good musicological arguments for killing minimalism off, um, and I think Patrick's book tack tackles this quite nicely. But I also think that when considering public-oriented scholarship, there are also important reasons to not just continue using it, but to revitalize it. In the public imagination, minimalist music isn't going anywhere. It's still the subject of records, playlists, festivals, and think pieces. Part of the project of On Minimalism was to seize a term that has long been in use and imbue it with a new, more expansive meaning that takes into account many musical and artistic voices, especially non-white male ones, that are usually left out of the conversation, and especially the non-academic conversation, to make minimalism better, hopefully, knowing it's likely sticking around. On the other hand, what if minimalism isn't actually sticking around? As in, what if the ongoing devastation of the media landscape outside of academia fashions a world in which those cultural intermediaries, journalists, critics, radio hosts, music writers, musicians themselves, and pretty much anyone who's not totally beholden to corporatized algorithms, no longer hold power in order to shape discourses around musical meaning? of the kind that once brought the idea of minimalism into existence and broader cultural recognition. There are only a handful of full-time music critics left in the United States. Pitchfork was just subsumed into GQ. The New Yorker writer um, Alex Ross, in a recent talk at Bowling Green, made actually the case for musicologists to fill this void. Even if our profession is also crumbling, it may ultimately be, as Ross put it, quote, the best guarantee of informed, free-thinking writing on music. 
Many of us scholars focus more on critiquing and historicizing the village voice and New York Times critics who invented the discourse around minimalism then while becoming them. And I'm not recommending we all start blogs and review concerts. But I did want with this project to offer a new scholarly understanding of minimalism that would hopefully shape discussions outside the academy. That meant crafting a narrative that would ideally connect with all kinds of listeners and practitioners across the genre spectrum, from percussionists performing Steve Reich in their school of music ensemble, to ambient musicians playing at a DIY venue, or perhaps even some of the techno dads at the at this rate. Um, basically, a book that could be appreciated by Elian Radig, John Adams, and Andre 3000, or at least their fans. Ideally, a book like this will fill in gaps for younger musicians, helping them imagine a new, more capacious genealogy for themselves, and perhaps in an ideal world, shape their future creative practices. The word minimalism as a label for what the book contains then might be less important than the connections a reader could make as they page the documents we reprint. And I think, and this is just me spitballing right now, I think that's also in some, to some degree the case for the writers who are inventing this term in the 1670s, that the term was a vehicle for them to talk about the things that they thought were interesting in conversation. Um, I was very heartened to talk to a podcaster last year who said that On Minimalism helped him rehear some of his lifelong favorite music. He mentioned McCoy Tyner, Downtown No Wave, and Donna Summer in a totally new way. And those are three things not, are, not typically found in most books on minimalist music. As important as it is for musicologists to offer critical interrogations and deconstructions, I believe there's also immense value in us building new histories. Histories that are accessible, useful, and hopefully transformative. Thank you. So we've got a bit under an hour left. We are going to transition to, I've got some questions for all of us. We're going to talk among ourselves for maybe like 30 or so minutes, and then we'll open things up to the room. But this is kind of why we wanted to do this, was to have this conversation in front of you that will hopefully be interesting to all of you. Um, so I'm going to move this down. You guys want to make sure that mic works. is that one of the kind of central areas that's emerged across these various projects is this question, as kind of Patrick framed it in his opening talk, of the focus on critiquing minimalism as it has long existed in scholarship and the popular imagination, this kind of big four. Is that coming from this room? <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> um, you know, kind of, do we focus on this kind of dealing with minimalism as has as long existed and try to critique it and find ways of grappling with the existing notion of minimalism? Or do we kind of take this term and try to push it to be something broader or more inclusive or different, which is in some degree what Carrie um, and I are interested in. And so I'm hoping maybe to start, we can kind of dwell on this potential dichotomy or non-dichotomy and open it up for, for thoughts on that area among the folks. We don't have to go down. Yeah, like, people should jump in. Just, yeah. I don't want this to be like a serious conversation. Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Patrick said it well, that it isn't necessarily an either or. But I do think in every context, you know, decisions are made that, like, especially in the, in the context of doing public scholarship, which are representing the entity. So, like, one, for example, one, I think, important problematic, like person that doesn't exist, like appear in your super capacious, wonderful to read book, would be someone like Moondog, right? Uh, a blind musician uh, who, uh, I forget, it's something Harvey, right? But it's like, who was Harvey? Yeah. Um, and he, but it was also like, it held, held pretty explicit white supremacist beliefs. Um, he, you know, but he also like crashed on uh, Bill Glass's couch for uh, some time, and he and Glass and Reich made recordings with him. Like it's fascinating, and, and he was in some ways one of the many inspirations for for what those people were doing. Um, it's that there's one moment I think in Russell Hartenberg's book where he says that the maracas and four organs probably came from him. Um, 
you know, I mentioned that in my essay on Borg and said in my book. Um, so, you know, he's someone, he's a white guy, he's an unusual subject position in all sorts of ways, also troubling, right? And I think maybe that's part of the issue that I think, you know, when I sort of read the book and read, you know, it's great to read about John Coltrane and Alice Coltrane, who I think are in you know, many ways less minimalist than someone like the Moondog, but Moondog is like, makes you feel bad about what this is, right? And to me, I think you should feel bad about what this thing is, as well as enjoy it or whatever. Right? Like, it, there's, so anyway, more time like this. I'll just say real quick, I don't think I knew that Moondog was a racist. Um, <laughs> and I think we had a folder on him, and we were looking for stuff. But, you know, one of the main criteria in this book was like, we created a folder, a Google Drive folder, for essentially everyone that could be part of the conversation and then just populated them with documents as we found them. And part of it, one of the reasons people got left out was often like we couldn't find an interesting, acceptable document. And sometimes that's like Carrie created essentially that, that interview in, in a way. But yeah, that was a case where it was like, well, there's nothing that fits well. I mean, like Dennis Johnson's not even there right? yeah. for that same reason. Yeah, but yeah, Carrie. Yeah, I, I just want to say, like, our goal wasn't to include everybody. <laughs> Um, and so, I mean, so many people have said, you know, what about this person and what about this person? Like, I think the idea, like, in pushing it back against the, the big four is to just, like, this was way bigger, so big, in fact, that you could not possibly include enough people. But also, like, to Will's point, because it's a source reader, we're trying to find sources. And, like, we did have the idea that, like, for a topic where we couldn't find anything on them, we might solicit writings or do our own interviews in, in a small, like the Inea Lockwood interview, I did that one. Um, but that's not, we were looking for historical source documents and like, I promise you, I, I challenge you to find one on Moondog, like we just couldn't find one. But it's, there's a great uh, edited collection on Moondog, Philip Glass writes the foreword where he talks about how racist Moondog was, but also at the Steve Reich archives, there's recordings of Moondog yeah. playing with Reich and Glass and Gibson and there, those are incredible yeah. source documents. We couldn't include audio source documents, but that would be a cool thing for someone to study. I'll just say something real quick, and then I don't want to make this panel about our book, because there are other books. Um, but <laughs> the other thing is, like, I think both of us in a lot of the conversations and a lot of the response to our book, it's been a conversation about including a bunch of people. But like the actual structure of the book and the larger goal of the book is not about the number of people or quote unquote voices we include, even though that's often what we end up talking about, because the book is dealt with thematically. So like the idea is to kind of move away from this notion of like four or ten or forty composers and say like these are actually the ideas behind minimalism that we actually see being populated by all of these different voices, often across genres, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Someone else. I was yeah. I'll say something too. Um, because I mean, it's really kind of framed as a comment, and, and also you said on my book, I was like, did I do that? Um, but I mean, I think to me, I read it a while ago. I read yeah. it a <laughs> no, I'm happy to be credited with saying we should ditch it. That's fine. Um, I think to me, one of the really interesting things is, and this is my first book. I'm a relatively junior person. I've been very nervous about how people would read it and respond to it. And so thinking in terms of, you know, recent conversations around diversifying repertoires and thinking through your repertoires and recognizing who is left out and all these really important things. I was like, I'm just gonna go even further into these handful of white dudes and kind of see what you find in that. And I feel like I'm happy with that. I also have anxieties around still too, and kind of that polemic of inclusion versus digging into the, the problems of it. Um, but one of the things I always do think of too is that like, there's a real sense, I think I kind of get this from reading on Sumon's work and others that like, there's a real sense in that moment in around 1980 that minimalism named a white use of things like repetitive rhythm, complex polyrhythm, um, free improvisation, collective kind of collaborative processes. Um, and so I have a few things like this that were kind of like quite late to my book that when I reread a while ago, I was like, I'm not sure these are the most clear parts of the book, but like, I think I included the conversation with Brian Eno where he's naming like, you know, what the major influences are on, on um, I can't remember if it's Talking Heads or someone else, but he just names all these influences and says, and minimalism, but everything he names as an influence other than minimalism is like, you know, these black generic things that are traits of minimalism. And so to me, I think I've felt over and over and over that what you're naming as minimalism is something that is a whitening of any kind of ad reinhardt like white space of things that are you know, being covered up and ignored. And so that's why I have an anxiety or kind of these, these additive things too. And so, but of course, it's not just minimalism, you know? And then, but then the problem becomes how do you ever do anything better or escape anything if you have that kind of anxiety and cynicism 
towards increasing and adding new things. But I think I get nervous with us and musicologists around the kind of sense that like it's benevolent to call anything music towards like add anything to any repertoire when it's maybe kind of more of just like a claiming and stealing and hoarding and hoarding and hoarding and accumulation over and over. Um, so that's you know sort of mindset comes into all this. I think yeah, maybe by the end I do say like let's just stop talking about middleism or something. I forget, but. And yet you wanted to do this panel. It was my idea. <laughs> I mean, it's fun to talk about this problem. I mean, again, it kind of gets at, I think, really core disciplinary things right now. I mean, look back at, you know, what the books from 20 years ago were all about, too, and it's, it's different. Um, I think the shared priority among all of these is what else can be within this and how can it be beneficial, but then what traps do you risk falling into? I mean, I'll, I'll just say, oh, and can we turn the iPad? Do we need the slides anymore? Because we could turn the iPad for our friends are oh, yeah, 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 yeah. toward the, the iPads. Um, yeah. But uh, anyway, so I, I mean, I'm uh, pro. That's great. Thank you. Um, pro keeping minimalism, I guess, not not totally ditching it. Um, it. In part because it is institutionally, geographically, historically, racially specific um, in a lot of ways, though not entirely, right? And it's porous and it's open-ended. Um, and yet it's, you know, one example of uh, many sorts of musics that uh, involve drums and repetition, that focus on sort of the presence and tactility of sound, uh, that uh, sort of strive to extend our temporal, the listener's temporal horizons, right? Uh, and minimalism is one term among many of, of musics that do this. Uh, one thing that we haven't brought up, surprisingly, is the origins of the term in visual art, um, in painting and sculpture, and the way that, that um, you know, that the reasons for that term to be latched onto these composers um, was, in part, you know, accrediting from the discourses of uh, museum art and high fine art. And, you know, and, and you'll, you can see in some other scholarship where connections are being made between uh, media, minimalist media, uh, that there are certain tendencies of the music that also tend to get highlighted. I'm thinking of uh, Mark Botha's book, The Theory of Minimalism, which is very interesting, um, sort of conceptualization of minimalism um, trans historically and across arts. And we do find, you know, sort of a focus on the avoidance of expression, uh, commitment to asceticism. And thinking about uh, minimalist art as a metatextual sort of disquisition on the nature of art, and I think all of those things are quite valuable about um, really this more, much more specific definition of minimalism that might be worth retaining. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I think like the the, the visual art, like it's a question about power. Like this term has had a lot of power, but like. I think the existence of the visual art conversation that essentially the music critics could latch onto and then bring, like that was a way for them to get their foot in the door to then give this term power to music, it seems like. Like the labor power of a John Rockwell or a Tom Johnson talking about these things again and again and again was a vehicle for them to do something. And I think if it didn't already exist, they probably wouldn't have been able to accomplish it in a way, like with impressionism and music too, right? Like there's a reason why these why even though we probably should not, even though I probably shouldn't teach Debussy as quote unquote impressionism based on most of the history, it's still really useful and easy, makes it job easier to do so, right? Um, yeah. I just wanted to quickly return to what you were saying, Patrick, about like anxiety and like inclusions of inclusion, because I had I have anxiety about <laughs> everything, but especially about <laughs> yes, and I it kept me up at night because like it's true, we benefit from having, say, Alex and Train in our book. Like, we we, we gain from that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> keep on I think they are out there. Um, and yeah, we gain things. Um, but one thing that we didn't do in our book that other books on minimalism do is that we didn't say, like, minimalism, if, if, you, if you have a piece that has loops and drones and additive processes and four or five things, you got yourself a minimalist piece. Like, <laughs> There, there's a whole like part of, of minimalist scholarship that is trying to say like, oh no, 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 you need these characteristics in order for it to be technically minimalism. We've never done that. We said like things that revolve around loops and drums, and that's it. And so then as we kind of dug into music around loops and drums, 
we saw things like Alice Coltrane's All Star Band that looks so similar to, you know, the All Star Band. I'm blanking right now. Okay. The Jerry Jennings All Star Band, like a mix of North Indian classical music with drone-based uh, Western classical um, instruments in like nearly the same year in the same venue, and we just put them in the same chapter. We just put them in the same chapter and we're kind of interested to, for other people, because it's a source reader, to come to, the, um, to, come to conclusions about it. I mean, I, I have my own conclusions and we obviously have um, kind of our own uh, point of view, but we're not doing it um, totally to benefit from it. But the other, like, I think, thing to grapple with in, in terms of the source reader is that, Will, you were just saying, like, doing what's easy. like. The easiest thing to do with the source reader would, to put, would be to put free things in there. But like <laughs> every item, almost every item costs money. And so like Alice Colt, including Alice Coltrane in the book was actually really expensive. <laughs> so and, and including Steve Reich in the book was actually really cheap. But like really interesting things about like- Laman Young was not cheap. Was not cheap. <laughs> and so like there's also really interesting backstory to like the budget of this book and like what we could afford to do, like what we paid to include, what we didn't pay to include. And so like, it's, it's I'm just here to say it's really complicated, um, not just in terms of like the politics of inclusion and what you gain, but also just like the, the budget of inclusion and the access and what's easy and, and what's not. Yeah. I, I would read that article. You guys should write that article. I was just gonna say that you should write that article yeah, because like the kind of making of, I, I remember when Jeremy Grimshaw did an incredible talk about the reception about his book by Lamont Young and all of this sort of stuff that unfolded. And I don't think he ever published that. Um, no. and, uh, but he, you know, it should be out there somewhere. It was extraordinary. And yeah, you should publish the making of it and the budget. So. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, UC Press was incredibly generous and surprised. He was $10,000 and we carved up that $10,000 in a hundred ways. And we, <laughs> we didn't have anyone helping us with permission, so we were doing all those emails. There's a lot of emails. We should, I should pull up the spreadsheet. No, I, I probably can't pull up the spreadsheet because it has numbers on it. But, uh, uh, one person cost us 10% of the money. I, I just, like, though the, this question of, like, what is minimalism, and I like that you call it, like, churlish to, like, say, like, what you can and can't include. I, I also don't really care about that either. And Patrick, you have this great line in your book that basically says, like, how do you include something as diverse as, like, pendulum music? and I don't forget what the other piece is, like classes, music and folk parts under the same rubric. And you say like, you can't, it's just like they were friends. Like, it, was, <laughs> it was the same scene. They were part of a community. And like, th there's a certain extent to which like, it's not it's not all about music, but what we're calling. Um, what we're calling. Yeah, I mean, we, sorry, I'll let you go. Um, we definitely, like the book is in a way extremely under theorized in like that we really don't tell you what minimum is beyond the idea that like minimalism is the whole book. If you read it, you'll know what it is. But like, and that's also like the term movement allows us, I think, to get away with including a lot of things. And I'm dealing with this now. And some of my graduate students at my minimalism seminar may be on watching now. But like, where I'm like, oh crap, did we not clearly define this enough such that <laughs> teaching it in the context of seminars is clear and intelligible? Um, but it is also the case that like it allows us. And I think Carrie, I don't remember how exactly how you articulated this, but you're using some point of like. It can be like very clear aesthetic connections, but it can also be some combination of like stylistic similarities, but also social relationships and larger, but also like the effects of the music. And that's why like for us, and it sounds like for you, Simon, like Julia Perry didn't really make sense in that context because even though there were maybe some similar aesthetic sensibilities, the effect of the music or the kind of relationship, let's say to like almost everything in the book that's happening in the 1670s is related in some sense to like North Indian classical music. So like, we, we are almost implicitly defining, like you have to either pass through one of these kind of portals. If you're heading in a drones and repetition direction, if you're not passing through North Indian classical music, modal jazz, or kind of like post cajun or serialism, like you might not arrive at what we end up calling minimalism. So it's not necessarily about, you have to have this list of categories, but it is like these pathways and connections that, and also about the, the psychoacoustic transcendent effects of the music that's, that the composers are intending. Vic, Vic, also, oh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I wanted to sort of also, yeah, respond to Karen's thing. Yeah, how, how can this all be one kind of music? 
Um, and indeed, I mean, well, as you were pointing out, it can be one sort of experience, which is why, you know, I, I wonder if we're um, getting rid of the term minimalism just as a thought experiment. And, you know, minimalism is really only minimal relative to Cold War avant-garde practices. Um, and so uh, I say bring back the hypnotic school. This is a very good yeah. statement. <laughs> bring back the hypnotic school. Uh, you know, it's high time to draw out the links between psychedelic culture and practices of um, trancing and transcendence and meditation and contemplation. Here you do this a lot in your work, which I really appreciate. Um, and I think more can be said about this. The, um, you know, there's been a long-standing repression of the hedonic qualities of this music and the focus on physical sensation. Um, we could get a really great uh, queer and or feminist reading of this music with this in mind. Uh, so uh, Elizabeth Le Guin um, sort of has something like this on ambient music, this article, Uneasy Listening, which I really recommend. And I, I can see uh, more minimalist scholarship going direction as well. I'll just say real quick, that was what appealed to me about doing this project originally, which is basically like, we were all at this minimalism conference 10 years ago, and I pitched this idea to Patrick and Carrie and Ryan E. Bright and Sasha Metcalf, because I saw all these papers with people, and I was like, wait, minimalism? Like, Steve Bryce was doing that in the 60s? I had kind of like no idea, and I was like, we should talk about that. And it actually had nothing to do with the Coltrane's and this, uh, a lot of the kind of inclusivity stuff that came much later. Um, but it was like, Oh, I didn't realize yoga and meditation and psychoacoustic and psychedelic drugs were all actually like central to this because all of that stuff seems stripped away from my understanding of what the of what the movement had been. I just um, on Juliet Perry, I do think you mentioned kind of like earlier precedents for like Charles Seeker or um, Lou Harrison, and I can't help but think like Ruth Crawford Seeker. There's one movement of the string quartet, 1931, that is just like absolutely proto-minimalist, and she was way deep into theosophy and meditation. <laughs> and so if we want to discount Julie Perry as the, the, you know, like maybe she wasn't after the same kind of hypnotic effects that minimalists are supposed to be, I think Ruth Crawford Cedar was. But <laughs> Yeah, but I, this is what I mean. Like, we're getting really excited about like like the the yeah. tentacles of minimalism growing. Yeah. Like exactly what Patrick was warning about. Yeah. And I think if you look at Ruth Crawford, who you know is a really really important composer. Like to me, Ruth Crawford is more important than the middle. You know? And so like like and a lot of what the history of modernism is is like you know altering sensation through like dissonant, challenging materials, right? And so much of her music is that way. And so to me, like, there's just something not in the spirit of, what, you know what I mean? Yes, there's that string quartet, and it's wonderful. It's, you know, it's, you could say it's like Ligeti, too, right? You could say it's like... Well, most of the thing. primary sources right. say Reingold Prelude. Yeah. Right, that's right. Prelude. Yeah, that's, so, you know, and I, I guess I, I would say, like, that one of the ways to kind of carve up the minimalist, minimalist project would be, like, where did it go? And if one is, like, the kind of things that Vic is talking about, the technologies of the self, I think is a really important kind of thread. Another one is really like what Steve Rice talks about in terms of like a restoration. You know, it's a, it's a kind of, cons at least in his mind, a conservative movement to try to kind of undo modernism and to kind of reinstantiate what I think of as like a middle of the road MOR classical music, which is, you know, that's a lot of, that's a, there's a lot of that out there now that was there before, it was there during minimalism. And it's more like it just kind of articulates with that. And that's the kind of, Adams and later Reich and later Glass and like lots of other people, the Torquies, you know, this kind of stuff, right? And was there Americana style, you know, neoclassical style stuff that had like jumpy rhythms and pulses and grooves? Yes, they did, you know? And so that, to me, there's like a whole other kind of, it's the sort of the conservative, like absorb that into the kind of, you know, concert music mainstream element of minimalism, which is the non experimental part of it. So that's a that's a whole other part of it, right? And then and then I think there's another kind of like thread, which I think you know, and I think these things overlap in various ways. Not so much the kind of the MLR classical music version, but which is the kind of the rock pop vernacular, you know, and it's developed underground range, you know, which is you know it, again like personally in my taste, like the sort of some of my favorite part of this. But Lou Reed was also a super problematic dude, as much as he's queer and there's all kinds of really interesting stuff about him. He's also super racist at times, right? And like, there's all kinds of crap associated with Ruby, right? I mean, he's a difficult, complicated person. But I love those songs. Like, I just love the Velvet Underground. I just do. And so, uh, one of the things in my own thinking on this is, 
I feel like I have to kind of, as I'm thinking and I'm dealing with the kind of chapters that are sort of coming together, which offer basically like different kind of hermeneutic lenses of how to think about minimalism. I think that's one of the things that people don't tend to care about as much because hermeneutics has become less fit, you know, sort of fashionable in music studies. It seems like basically people don't want to like closely read and get into the details of the notes in favor of like thinking about networks and like social relations and all this was really interesting and really important, but I, you know, maybe it's the music theorist in me that likes to kind of dig into and spend time thinking about what these things are and how they mean. And I think in those contexts, like trying to kind of engage with the strongest things about the practice critically. This is something I take from Giovanni Arbiki, who told, I think, his students as an advisor, you know, you should attack an argument on its strongest points, mm -hmm. not on its weakest points. I thought that's really remarkable. Um, I don't think I always achieve that, but I think that that's a, a good lesson. And so for me, I like as I'm trying to criticize it and think through it, I'm also thinking about like what do I really love about it, and how do I kind of engage with that in a, in a critical, useful way. And I'll just jump into um, to say that kind of my longer history of this too, because I think a big part of Will kind of asked you know about, about that as the one who closed the session for us, because I think to me one of the really exciting things is in keeping with the kind of a collectivist and collaborative kind of ethos of minimalism that's kind of most important to me. I think when I was an undergrad, I remember reading like Keith Potter's book and Bob Fink's book after I had fallen in love with this music, and I encountered like harmonic analyses, and so I was like, that's not what's interesting in this. And that was kind of just my initial undergrad impulse, but then following kind of the collaborative, collective dynamics I was interested in brought me to um, New Amsterdam and the classical kind of things that Will's thesis is on, and in Long Beach in 2013 for the Society for Minimalist Music, I saw Will present on that work, and I was like, oh, there's even like longer dynamics of this in minimalism that people haven't heard about either. And so I think the thing that to me that made me want to do this panel and thinking kind of in that ethical direction rather than a stylistic direction is I think a really fun thing is as a result of the Society for Minimalist Music and other things that like we have all been in conversation more or less pretty much not fun through 10 years of collaboratively um, sharing sources. Um, Carrie is the most capaciously generous, like short source sharer I, I know. Um, and I think I was, you know, in grad school being trained, like, don't share things with anyone, don't show people your work, it's yours, you need to get it first. And like, and then working with these people and working on this music, I was like, I'm pretty sure that people work together, things generally go together. <laughs> um, that seems to be just ethically inherent through almost all the time. Um, and so yeah, I think to me it just kind of grows out of all those relationships. And so I'm I'm glad to have this kind of conversation still happening. And to see that even where there are kind of, you know, ostensibly critical disagreements and kind of the methodological approaches of all these books, they all kind of agree on a general problem that we received from those books of 20, 20 plus years ago now that are wonderful, but you know, that it, as things do need their updates and need their reflections. And I'll say one thing, when I pull my manuscripts together, I will definitely be sending it to all four of those. <laughs> so, um, yes, and one without them. We'll attack it on this weakest argument. <laughs> um, uh, one thing that was really interesting reading Patrick's book while working on finishing our book was that like Patrick makes a really strong case for a lot of the things that he's arguing through the use of secondary sources. Like you, know, you have a great chapter where you talk about kind of the myths of the big four through the lens of the book book interviews that they give in the 1980s. And like what we were seeing the primary sources was basically like all of that was preceded by basically identical conversation that they're having like five to ten years earlier in the primary so like in the in the historical documents and then there's like stuff like this my favorite document in the book is this absolutely bananas interview interview that Charlene Palestine who's an absolutely bananas person gives in the late 1980s where this writer uh, calls him up to interview him for Sonic Youth Sonic Youth Zine um, Sonic Death and he asks he literally calls him Charlene Palestine is in Paris doing um, and says like, what are you up to now? And the thing we print is like a four page rant responding to that where he's just like cursing <laughs> and talking about how like everyone sold out the movement and like what we made together was like this beautiful pure thing but now it's all just sonic aspirin and they're all on, uh, they're all on magazines and covers and I'm in exile in Paris even though I grew up in Brooklyn. And it's just this incredible, I mean, ranting document that attests to the experience of having gone, gone through minimalism becoming a thing, mm. like and like what it means when the, the people you are hanging out with and making weird music with suddenly are kind of famous and you can't stand it and also are 
on some kind of drugs. <laughs> but um, but it, it was like reading what he says in that interview is what your book is in a way. Like um, it reminded you that person that when they were dating your book, and, uh, it reminded me of the Walter Zimmerman one in Desert Plants with Lamont Young, where she just buzzes Lamont Young at his apartment, and he transcribes the conversation they have where Lamont's just like, "Did you get the money? Did you get the money?" And then he's like, "No," and doesn't. But he publishes it, which is just like so funny and so good. And I love. I mean, you guys got the source material from Young, and you had the money. I my approach to him was just to not talk to him and not ask for it and, and, and favor use my way through the movie. So that's that was really good. But curious note that maybe we should open to yeah, we should open as well. Yeah. Yeah. If folks have questions, we should use yeah. that microphone so that people can come. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Thank you all. Um, this is a question for Carrie and Will, but also for everyone. I mean, since you two wrote a source reader, um, it's a hypothetical question, but what, what do you wish existed in terms of sources for um, you know, a, a movement that's, that's relatively recent to be studying and that involves, as you've all talked about, people that are still alive? I mean, if I'm gonna wish, I want video footage of of this all. Like, I want more. I want. I just want more. Like, I want to see what's happening. I want to see like the body language. There's a great early drumming rehearsal video that I love so much because you get to see who's in the audience. No one's paying attention. Um, it, it's a rehearsal, but like, yeah, you see their body language, you see how, like, the kind of social interaction. Um, I would love to have, like, videos of rehearsals. There's uh, recordings of rehearsals for Music 18, which are really interesting to listen to because you hear performers giving, like, feedback to Reich, which, you know, he takes interestingly. Um, <laughs> and so that kind of stuff, like, I, I, I personally want more. I'm more more interested in like off stage stuff, like the stuff that's absolutely influencing the music that gets like recorded and shared, but like is lost unless you ask someone about it or have some kind of document that shows it to you. So yeah, if I'm wishing, that's what I want. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote this article for the Times a few years ago about minimalism and turtles, um, <laughs> which was a lot of fun because both. Sorry, I'm telling the truth. Um, both Meredith Monk has had a long standing relationship with her. Oh, it's not. It's not showing up. Oh, is it? Uh, well, there we go. Yeah. There, just keep on dragging. Okay, yeah, yeah, let me. Yeah, you can see this turtle. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, hold on, I'm just going to mirror it. Um, and I'll talk. So, uh, Meredith Monk has had a turtle for like 40 years, Neutron. Um, oh, I know it's on that screen. I'm going to try to read it. Oh, God <laughs> damn it. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the option to. Okay. Okay, so I, Lamont, there are all these stories of basically anyone who went down, who was, oh my God, where is it? <laughs> okay, here we are. Um, so the, the, the main thing that got me interested in this was, this is Meredith Monk and her turtle in Neutron. Um, I got to interview both of them. Um, but Lamont, there are all these stories of all these downtown musicians who, arrive in New York and they want to kind of learn from Lamont Young in the 60s or early 70s and they end up feeding us turtles and it becomes like a, almost a full-time occupation because these turtles have these like really intense um, giants. <laughs> <laughs> and so I talked to uh, a couple of the folks who did that and it was just something that was mentioned in a lot of different scholarship. And also the theater of eternal music is kind of iconic for the group. They, the piece they were theoretically performing over many evenings in the 1960s was called The Tortoises, Dreams and Journeys because they were and I still don't quite understand this, but using um, building their drone off the amplification of this turtle tank, I think. Yes, the, yeah. it's the, motor. Motor. the motor. So I want to, I wrote this article and I asked Young, um, I asked Young if he had it, I knew Judy Young and Zazila, and I asked them if they had any photos. And this is the photo that they sent, which as far as I know has not been published anywhere else. And I when you look at this photo and think about that this giant kitty pool sized Turtle Aquarium was in the place where they were performing, and yet no one mentions this in like their reviews. It's like, what else was going on <laughs> that this was not something that people were talking about that much? 
And that's like, it's exactly what Carrie said. Like, I want, I want more photos, I want more documentation. Like, how, how much was happening? And like, the story that we were able to tell in the beginning of the book about the theater of eternal music being a drug, collectively arrested for drugs, uh, I, that comes from Ted Gordon's research. It's like, all of these things, there's so much more happening that we just don't even, we are only getting a tiny slice of. And obviously, uh, the, the answer to your question is, Lamont Young needs to release the tapes, is also like, um, uh, yes, every so it, they exist. A lot of this stuff exists. But uh, just yeah, uh, we don't need to get into it, but there's a huge dispute, and and Oman Young has an archival material that is massive and hundreds of hours um, of those of, of, and, and is tied up in all kinds of crazy stuff. But yeah, um, I would at least very like to like to know more about the turtles. But yeah, <laughs> Jerry Riley also had a turtle aquarium, and I I requested I, I reached out to his manager to ask if he would talk about his turtles, and he to speak about this now. <laughs> so also, like, what's going on there? <laughs> uh, other questions? <laughs> Thanks so much. This panel was really fun, fantastic turtle content. Um, my name is AJ Kluth. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if we're thinking about, like, buckets or conceptual buckets where we're trying to put or not put minimalism, um, and thinking of kind of benevolent expansionism, um, there have certainly been other attempts, you all have mentioned Bob Pink's book a couple of times, right? He's thinking about cultural practice, he's borrowing from Raymond Williams' structure of feeling idea, um, excuse me, in a relationship to industrial production consumption. Um, are there other good alternatives that would be better than genre or that kind of recognizes as a bigger, better ecology that can recognize the complexity of this? What you said about like um, the effects of the music, maybe I'll just hand it to you. Uh, is is like another umbrella? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. If you want to say right. Well, I, I mean, on the, that level again, I'll just reiterate. You know, bring back the hypnotic school, and, and you know, think about um, all all sorts of musics that came in via um, you know North Africa and South Asia and East Asia and that were really, really influential on the way that a lot of people were thinking over the course of the 20th century. As Sumant said, this didn't start with the minimalists. Um, and yeah, you know, and, and in that sense, I think about like David Tube's book, Ocean of Sound, which, you know, minimalism is just this drop in a bucket of this much greater um, rethinking of what musical experience might be. One other, I guess, thread that um, I wanted to think about was uh, that uh, sort of ties into this um, is, the use of minimalist, minimalist <laughs> sounds in film, um, which is another place that it's really uh, had a lot of uh, influence. And I, you know, like in one of my film music classes, I'll, I'll tie um, sort of the grid sequence in Koya Nascazzi to uh, Brad Fiedel's score for The Terminator. Um, to the use of techno in the matrix and i think all of these things really do tie into a similar to similar meanings in the film you know if you think about like automatism and uh, mechanization and technologization and the sounds uh you know and through different styles that yet all have some kinship with minimalism um do uh sort of resonate on these on these registers. Rebecca Layden has a great uh, music theory piece on this, um, the possible meanings of minimalism. And so I think that's another uh, way that we can sort of rethink that umbrella. I also just want to say Vic's book does this really well. Yeah. Of like, it's so much, so much of it is actually about what we would call minimalism, but then it is also about those intersections with these things that aren't called minimalism, but could be called minimalism, just as minimalism could be called yeah, I agree with that, but also I was going to just add to that um, there is so much, you know, thinking and con I'm sure someone's written on it, but I think it's kind of more of a conversational thing. People seem to say, that, you know, minimalism is kind of the last of these series of isms of, mm -hmm. in the modernist thing, and there's kind of this whole sense of, like, throwing your hands up in the air, like, anything goes, what can possibly do? Um, I think, you know, Will's book, Industry, does a really great job of tracking through the 80s and 90s. Um, Tina Director Johnson's book does a really good job, but again, kind of around the holy minimalism, it's kind of like, hyphen it, hyphen it, hyphen it thing. I mean, just Will's, Will's kind of comments today about, you know, the need for more journalistic kind of engagement, maybe from us as music scholars, 
has me thinking more and more about you know the kind of bankrupting of that whole industry that Will also writes about an industry that um, I think we all give tons of credit to music critics, but we treat them as sources quite often, right? And they are the ones who are often doing the actual defining. That would we then show up belatedly and are like, mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 I should define it better. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there is something to that too. That you know maybe the fact of this incredible huge range of Ear Magazine and Soho News and Village Voice and New York Times and full-time critics and I'm sure they were all, you know, we have the same conversations they were all having at the bar afterwards out of that be handy sources too to see what they were all talking about over pints when the show ended. Um, and so I wonder if there's a degree too where we came. I think I, I consider myself kind of a historian of the present for the most part most of my work, despite this being in the 60s and 70s, the book, but I mean, I wonder if there are just ways, as little does, as Carrie does, and maybe some of you guys do too, but of, of engaging more readers more actively in what's actually happening right now with actual readerships and with actually trying to engage in the current situations um, would be interesting. And I know everyone, people do that. I'm not saying no one's thought of that, but just, you know, there is a real sense that um, some of this kind of thing of minimalism and then everything else is just like, like my, my students still view minimalism as like really recent to music. You know, like, Everything you listen to is newer than kids. But they, yes, they I have this conversation with the center. I was like, they're like, how could we, like, a canon, like, like, how could we decanonize the music so recently? I was like, you're talking about music that was written in the 1980s, and I guarantee you can come up with a pop canon for the 1980s, and also for 2019, if yeah. you want to. Yeah. 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 yeah, I guess I'll just add that, like, one piece of my project deals with sort of trying to think of the question of, and it's a question that people have talked about in various ways, but around musical ideology, and like, and, and the way that I sort of think about it is um, that if we think of hegemonic musical sort of practices, genres, within a kind of uh, broader sort of ecology of differentially, you know, sort of significant or present forms, I sort of think of musical ideology since you know you have to sort of attach you know I, ideology in other contexts is verbal in part right I mean it's con that bound up with like statements about like you know how one thinks about what is possible about the world it's bound up with like the linguistification of the unconscious and all these things like you know so so music ideology is always a weird kind of thing even though people don't be talking about it but I think one of the ways to get at it is to think about it differentially like. Like the way Saussure talks about language, right? Like things that are present have to be related to things that aren't present or in relation to them. So, you know, when you listen to lots of films or advertisements or, you know, backing tracks for various contexts, you know, television shows, whatever, video games, and any of which are like basically like late 80s glass, which a lot of it imitates, that's one sort of major strand. Um, what is it, what is it displacing? You know, and often in many cases it's displacing musics that you know, are versions, like processed or cheesy versions of the kind of rock pop vernacular. Um, they're also like, especially with music that features like, you know, concert style classical instruments, like often much of it is militaristic, right? It's like, it's like march tropes, like, you know, stuff that's still patriotic. If you watch the right channels, you know, you watch like, you know, like more conservative media, you'll still hear a lot of that. And so part of it is like, you can understand that well, minimalism in relation to those things it's often signifying a kind of, you know, liberal cosmopolitanism in relation to other kinds of media. If you think of an ideology differentially, and so that's that was that's one of the projects in the book. So, yeah, yeah I think that's. What I've just been. I don't know how many folks in the room have noticed how often Caroline Shaw stuff is now like in Netflix things, whether it's like her or the patient her or all these things. People just like and the one that I'm saying, like, go ahead and say, it, say it, I guess I'm going to go with that. But, um, yeah, yeah, no, but, oh, oh, well, that's like actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway, um, other questions? Thanks for this panel, it's been so fun. Um, I, my question is, um, if basically when is minimalism? Um, uh, particularly since you're thinking about so many ways of expanding it. Um, about 10 more minutes is the but just uh, in part also like it, this, is post-minimalism interesting as a term if you're expanding minimalism itself so much uh, and also you talked about the sort of earlier boundaries but is there a later boundary i'll say we definitely um 
effed over post-minimalism in our book, which was, I think, I, I kind of, parts two and three were largely me, the initial intellectual work in part one was, was Carrie and kind of organizing. Parts two and three are kind of 80s and afterwards. And so one of the goals was the book of the book, which we haven't really talked about, is to get away from this kind of evolutionary teleological narrative of this new, of minimalism being an evolutionary movement that goes from drones to on the beach and eventually John Adams. Like that really minimalism be, is proto, drones are in some way proto minimalist, but minimalism comes to fruition in the 1970s or so. And so, you know, we wanted to say, if it's a drone, it's minimalism. And so we can, so we chart drones all the way to today and like look at, in the final section of the book, there's more drone than pulse based music in that final chapter, which is about contemporary practice. And that was kind of a deliberate push against this notion that like the David Lyons or Nico Muley's or Missy Mazzoli's of the world are minimalism today. And I think we probably did that a little too much in part because I was getting sick of all of them from my pre all my previous work and was more interested in talking about weirder things. Um, but as a result, like there is a book, a chapter called Post Minimalism, and it's kind of this unreally thing that's been critiqued as upward views because we include a lot of different stuff in there. And there's a very short trip to that in the camp. Moving on. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the idea of post minimalism is to a certain degree predicated on an evolutionary notion of minimalism having reached an end stage or reached a, a path of fruition such that composers can then take this existing set of techniques and embed them into concert works, primarily concert works, notation, notated music, that minimalism becomes aesthetic slash style slash technique, as uh, the Tony Johnson article right, um, argues. And like, our book is like minimalism is an aesthetic style technique. It's like all of this other stuff, effects, psychoacoustics, and all that stuff. So we do go all the way up to the present. Um, I think the book becomes less theoretically rigorous as we move forward in time. And we do some weird moves, like including the chapter on Bumble Pfizer, um, which is not something, again, that people would typically include. But we wanted to kind of go against the grain and some of the original book, too. But I don't know if other folks have thoughts on temporality. Well, yeah, I mean, I, um you know, as I mentioned earlier, like if you're thinking about it as this very institutionally and historically specific thing, it ended in 1976, if not sooner, and that's that. Um, but minimalism is present if, with this expanded, you know, if you're thinking about it in this expanded way, like minimalism still is very popular. Drone music is very popular uh, in the underground, as is even more so, um, you know, techno sets. I mean, you know, just going to some of these raves and you really hearing how very minimal some of the music, not all of the music, but a lot of the music that these DJs are spinning for two to three to six hours. Go to Berghain in Berlin, oh my gosh. Like that is, you know, hundreds of people to this very, very austere uh, Berlin techno. Um, it's, it's, it, minimalism is very popular and alive right now if you think about it in this expanded way. And uh, I do sometimes. <laughs> I was going to agree with that, and I often think about this in relation to what Seth Brodsky writes about in relation to modernism, that, you know, there, there's one element of minimalism that, at least in my conception, still, like, is tied up and bound up with the long 1960s, and, like, the periodization of thinking about that and the way that you work through that is another thing that I and other people have done, and I think that that's, that is one element of it. It's sort of, you know, a kind of moment where the energies are concentrated and generate something that gets a name to, like, to rip off uh, Patrick's speech about names. But then there is an out like the way that Seth thinks about modernism, which is that it continues. It continues to have this life and exist. Minimalism also continues. And for me, the, the parts of it that are kind of really compelling are things like what Dick's talking about, the, the drone music world in the Twin Cities. There's like just a tons of this stuff just there. We have an event called Drone Not Drones, which uh, the band leader of Low Alan Sparhawk said in response to like U.S. drone attacks in the Middle East, and basically uh, this led to this festival where you have like 28 hours, which again like Lamont Young inspired, and they basically have just acts that continuously like maintain the drone, and people perform at different it's held in different places, but essentially like. There's always a drone continuously for 28 hours, and different acts are participating, maintaining it, and people are sleeping there and going to this. And so, like, there's there's a there's a kind of life, of, like a vernacular life of this stuff, which to me seems, in general, just much more compelling than than the sort of what I find more generally kind of the boring concert music version, you know. And so, um, yeah, uh, it's both has a periodicity of like I think 
you know, however you want to like slice it up where the beginning and ends, I don't care that much about that, but the historicity of that moment seems important. But then, yeah, it continues today, so I think that seems true of other practices. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to that too, that I think, again, part of my project as it began was thinking about that kind of lineage and how, how can you kind of claim that lineage for that drone music and, and kind of drone, not drones. That's more a political statement than it is a musical statement, which means very important. Um, but also, I live in, I live in Edmonton, Alberta. It's an amazing like, noise scene there. That's like small and scrappy as a label that, that is run out of their called Studio Laboratories. It's fantastic. I don't know about any or all of them consider themselves minimalism, but I'm quite certain that if you ask most of them what they thought of minimalism, I think they'd lean more towards Tommy Conrad and Sean in Palestine and the kind of more gritty vernacular off the wall area. And to me, I mean, in my, in my earliest thinking, my, for like my master's project, I was like, how do I define minimalism so that like Conrad and Young fit, but like John Adams doesn't fit? What's the definition of, what's the definition of argumentative infrastructure there that makes that make sense? Um, and that's kind of what I think I got to, because I just, I just didn't like that music. I didn't find it interesting or exciting. And so I wondered how to look into that history and find what was compelling to pull forward out of it personally. But. Yeah, I mean, as someone who has liked that music, the John Adams strand, and written about that kind of thing for a long time, this, the course of working on this book and working with Carrie pulled me much more into this kind of vernacular world that I found more continually compelling. But I also, I think, I, I really try to resist there is, I think, something more ethically appealing to musicologists about the DIY egalitarian mm. vernacular notion of minimalism, of basically the difference between, and to a certain degree, what we might say, like professional music making, which is like, the, my Bang Out of Can book is about the idea of composers wanting to remain professionals who don't just play, they're trying to, like, there's a DIY venue in my town that's great. I play there sometimes, I have friends who play there sometimes. Any, anyone who's touring on the East Coast with some weird drone band will play there, and it's pay at the door, and it's an amazing like, way of making music. But when I grappled with the work I wanted to do, it is not to say that that is a better way of being a composer than this other way of being a composer, which like, my Back in the book is essentially about uh, the generation of composers who decides to like, kill off the 60s. Like, it's the data, the data of the 60s, it's, it's like the beginning of the 80s and the 90s, and, the, and, and I, Argued with these composers about whether they were neocons because they weren't, and or 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 neoliberals or whatever. But it it what has been really um, what I feel like has deepened my understanding of all of this music is to be able to place all of these different composers within individual kind of aesthetic and ethical and social and political worldviews, such that like I can love David Lang for who he is and what he does. Or Julia Wolf and also love Carolyn in Palestine for what he does. And understand like these are fundamentally irreconcilable worldviews to a certain degree, even though they might appreciate each other. And that they're both medals or post medals. <laughs> We've got one more minute. Uh, should we just call it? Anyone else have anything pressing? All right, well, thank you to all of you for attending. Thank you for staying up. Uh,